Okay, can everybody, everybody hear me at the back? Okay, so apologies in advance. I've had a very bad cough this week, so my voice may go up and down depending. Um, there's going to be a, probably a lot of clearing my throat and a lot of water drinking throughout, uh, throughout the talk. Okay, so yeah, this talk is getting started with Drupal 8 module development. Let's look at this screen. Um, who am I? I'm Oliver Davis, um, OP Davis on most places, so Drupal.org, Twitter, GitHub, everywhere really. Um, lead I'm one of the lead developers at CTI Digital in Manchester. Uh, Drupal 7 and an 8, Drupal 7 and 8 core contributor. Uh, contrib module maintainer and contributor, so I maintain modules like override, override node options, uh, copyright block, um, a few really. Um, I'm a Symphony 2 hobbyist is probably the best way to describe it. So I've been doing a bit of research into Drupal, into, sorry, into Symphony 2, uh, probably the last so six or nine months or so really in any, any depth, uh, just to try and sort of get my head around that type of thing really, prior to Drupal 8. Um, I've released a few Symphony based things on GitHub. So if anyone's seen the Drupal VM generator project that went out quite recently, um, that's something I wrote based on Symphony console. Um, that builds a config.yaml file for you for Drupal VM. So it asks you questions of what you want to do and builds a file for you. So that type of thing, really. Um, the type of thing we're going to cover, um, where modules are located in Drupal 8 and how they're structured, how to build your own module with uh, permissions and routes. I'm going to try not to say routes, routes. Um, how to add your own controller and service classes. Uh, what is the dependency injection container and how do we use it? And a little bit of our tools like PHP Storm and Drupal Console. So there's going to be, if you're not used to Symfony or object oriented code, you can pick up some new buzzwords, I guess, throughout this. So can you move to your right a bit? To my right. A bit, yeah, this way? You. If the thing will stretch far enough. Yes. Okay. Is that better? Yeah. Okay. Cool. So module location, modules live in the modules directory. Um, I guess most people when they first come to Drupal, myself included, went, oh look, there's a modules directory. We'll put our modules in there. No, Mod <laughs> modules may go as we all know in the sites, site star something directory. Um, in Drupal 8, they go in the modules directory where we expect them to go. Um, core, core modules go in core slash modules. So, um, Yep, we can put modules in core slash uh, sorry modules slash contrib and module slash custom slash custom. Um, that still works. So if you're used to doing that in Drupal seven, you can still carry on doing that. Um, I'd recommend it. Um, so the simple module structure is we have we have um, an info.yaml file rather than an info file, um, potentially a dot module file. Uh, permissions.yaml, routing.yaml, and a number of controllers based in the SRC directory. I had notes. Um, so yeah, some new things. Um, YAML replaces the INI-ish format that we've always used in Drupal 6 and 7. Um, as I mentioned, the .module file isn't always needed. So yeah, only if you're using certain things we need that. It's quite possible to write Drupal 8 modules without a .module file. Um, permissions and routes are in separate files, as we just saw. <coughs> um, an SLC directory, sorry, <laughs> an SLC directory for storing your classes, so pretty much everything is done within PHP classes. Uh, no more .inc files, so within Drupal 6 and 7 we had a, a convention of calling things .inc, um, those don't live anymore. Um, and we use uh, namespaces and PSR for autoloading. So I'll mention a bit about that more in a second. So if you're not familiar with YAML, YAML is a, I think the two is a recursive acronym. Um, it stands for YAML Ain't Markup Language. Um, originally it was yet another markup language, but it was, it was changed. Um, it's basically simple key value pairs. So keys on the left, values on the right. Um, indentation matters, so if you're putting child elements, you just indent them with two spaces or four spaces if you're doing a symphony. Um, and you have to use spaces, so if you use tabs, it will shout at you. Um, so this is an example of the uh, system permissions.yaml. 
So the machine name is, um, can you see that at the back with the colors? Um, administer modules is the name of the, name of the permission. And the title is below, um, indented slightly, so it's within in that. Um, these are using quotes. Um, Core tends to use quotes quite a lot. They're not necessarily needed in YAML um, unless there's a certain syntax thing that you have to use them, but generally we don't, although in Core we seem to quite a lot. Um, so yeah, if you've got a basic module that just needs its own set of permissions, this is fine. Um, for something like the node module, obviously the content types are different per Put content, uh, content types are different per site, so we can use the permissions callback. So this is how we do it in overrated options, because again the content types are different. Um, so within the YAML, we specify um, a permission callback, and this essentially is a namespace class with the um, double colon and then uh, the method name. Um, so yeah, that double colon is called a scope resolution operator, apparently. Um, yeah, and we'll see how those namespaces work in a second. Um, so, is everybody familiar with namespacing? Anybody not familiar with namespacing? Okay, so namespaces are a way of having classes that are named the same that don't conflict with each other. That's the way I tend to think about it. So, the best way I've seen it explained recently was if you're organizing your music collection, uh, if you have all your songs in one big playlist, you'll get some with the same name and then conflict was if you group them by album, as in namespaces, they separated and don't conflict with each other. Um, that seemed to make a bit more sense to me at the time. Um, so everything is within the Drupal namespace. Um, one, there is a Drupalism here, so we're using the node keyword in this example, as in the lowercase one. Um, if you're doing symphony, that'll tend to be um, sort of camel cased or, or whatever, so it'll use the uppercase N for node. Um, but we do use the machine name there. Um, so if they're in within the SLC directory, it would be Drupal slash node. Uh, if it's within a controller subdirectory, it will have slash controller on the end. So these um, match up with the, your directory structure, essentially. Um, and then overhead options is the same with the underscores rather than the capital letters, not with underscores. Um, so autoloading. So autoloading is provided by Composer. Um, does Evie not know about Composer? Good. Um, so there's uh, an autoload file in the Composer directory. Uh, there is one in core as well, which um, will load something else. Um, it replaces the file square bracket syntax we're used to using. So we don't need to manually include each file or each class that we need. Um, the autoloader does that for us. Um, the standard is that uh, you use one class per file, uh, and the file name must match the name of the class. So if you're doing um, a no permissions cl class, it would be a no permissions.php. Um, the namespace must reflect the directory structure, as I said. Um, so what would in fact happen is Drupal slash node slash controller would be um, equal to core modules node SRC controller. Um, so this is part of the PSR for um, name as uh, standard for autoloading. Uh, routing, there is no more hook menu in Drupal 8. It's all done through um, using the Symfony routing component, although the two did exist together for a while in the early stage of Drupal 8. Um, hook menu is gone altogether, and again, it's all defined within YAML. Um, Symfony itself does other things apart from YAML. You can use PHP or annotation, uh, although in Drupal we're just using YAML. Um, so this is an example of the routing from the system module. So this one is, the machine name is system, system.admin. Uh, we give it a path, which is slash admin, um, a defaults key. And within the defaults key, we have underscore controller. So in the same thing, we have slash uh, Drupal, the fully qualified uh, namespace class, um, double colon, and then, <laughs> then the method name. Uh, we also give it a title um, for our route. Um, and we can also use requirements. So in this case, we have a permission requirement to access administration pages. Uh, see that way. Um, again, it's a bit more of a complex example. So the path routing, um, this one is using uh, square brackets PID. Um, so that's a, we're passing a variable in. So rather than using the percentage or um, 
like the percentage sign we're used to using in a hook menu, we use the square, square, um, sorry, the curly bracket name. Um, then default this time we have a form. So again, class name to a form and then a title and then a permission. So the main thing, I guess the difference with this is the fo underscore form and then um, the variable. <clears throat> Um, I was looking in still into why some have underscores at the beginning of them. So you can see they have underscore form and underscore title. Um, this is something I found on Drupal Stack Exchange site, which explain it. Um, underscores are specified for everything that are not parameters to the controller. Um, it's sort of the same within Symfony. <clears throat> um, okay, so creating your own module. Um, create a directory within modules or modules as custom as you sort of would do normally. We add a .info.yaml file and then we add any additional files that we need. So .module files, .routine.yaml files or .permission.yaml if you need them. Um, so I've made an example module. This one's called uh, obviously the DribbleCamp London module because it's DribbleCamp London. Um, its core is 8.x. There is a new type of module, so that didn't exist um, in 7, but now we have to define the type. So that could be module or theme, I guess. Uh, and the package works in the same way. I'll group them by package name. And this is fairly similar to the, the, the info cell syntax we're used to seeing, but it's colon separated rather than equal sign separated. And the number of times I've tried doing a Drupal 7 module in this way and then we're trying to figure out why it's not working. Um, quite a few times, quite recently. Um, so in this case, we're going to add a route, a route even. Um, so I've tried to not use the hello slash name example, but I've got as far as speakers slash name. So in this case, we're going to make a path speakers slash name. Um, so the name would also be, would be an argument. Uh, we're given the, the page a title called speakers. Uh, I've made this controller. So it's because it's within the DC London module. Um, the, the namespace is Drupal slash DC London. Uh, I've added a controller directory and then the file and therefore the class is called speaker controller and the method within that is called hello. And then it just requires on the, on the access content permission. Um, so this is, an, is what this file would look like. Um, class called speaker controller within our namespace. Um, the function is hello. The variable name is name in this case. And we're returning the markup. Um, so we still have render arrays. So this is slightly different. So Symphony would normally you re return um, a response class um, from HTTP, HTTP Foundation. <laughs> but um, yeah, we're still using render arrays. So you pass um, this should be fairly familiar to everybody um, using an array with a hash markup at the beginning. Um, the interesting thing with this, if you go back a slide, is um, curly brackets name. Um, so whatever is there, whatever that string is, that's what the variable name becomes. So it's not done in position, it's done based on name. So if I had more than one of those, I could reorder them uh, and then as, as arguments however I want to, um, as long as the names match up, it's, it's fine. Um, in this case, we're just using the T function. The T function is still there. Um, and if you're not, if not familiar with this square bracket syntax, that's uh, PHP 5.4 uh, array shorthand. So it's used within Drupal uh, 7 quite a lot with the PHP uh, requirement being 5.5 five something. We can use that quite safely. Um, so this is what that page would output. So I've gone to speaker slash Oliver and then it's said hello Oliver at the, at the bottom. Um, so that's fine. So the next step would be to change this to a service. So a service is just a class that does something. Um, you also get some model classes, which are things like nodes, which just hold data, but a service class is something that actually does a job and provides, um, provides a service, hence the name service. Um, so what we do in this case is I've made, within that SLC directory, I've made a subdirectory called service. So the namespace has slash service in it. Uh, I've made a new class called speaker greeter this time um, with a function of greet. Uh, we're just going to capitalize the first letter using the UC first function and return it back. So very simple, straightforward um, controller. Um, and then, sorry, within the controller, we can uh, import the class using the use statement. So we're saying use anything within that namespace. Uh, we can 
instantiate it using the new keywords. We're saying new speaker greeter um, as this variable, and then we can use the greet method within the greeter um, class and pass it the name. That works fine. So services, all we've done is move code around. We haven't changed and we haven't added anything new. Um, we just moved some code around essentially at this point. <coughs> Um, service container is something that's sort of fairly new. If you're not used to using um, object oriented things, um, it's added by Symfony's dependency injection component. Uh, it's an object that essentially holds other objects and instructions on how to create them. Um, so it's a centralized place for you to create all your service classes. Uh, it makes them reusable, um, so you can reuse services in different modules. Um, and they're only instantiated when they're needed to be. So um, the drawback, if I go back up the slides with this approach, is whenever you're calling somebody's name, you're instantiating a new speaker greeter class on every occasion. If you're using a service container, it creates one instance of that class and reuses it every time. So it's better for uh, performance, really. Also, it's cleaner, we don't need that. Um, yeah, the only container we needed, and there's only ever one instance. Um, as I said. Um, so the service container is also um, known as the dependency injection container. They're, they're the same thing. So if we wanted to add our service class in the container, this is what we do. Um, we'd add a, a mymodule.services.yaml file. Um, our controller would then extend another class called controller base, which we didn't need to inherit uh, extend before. Um, but that adds um, a create method uh, which then basically means it's after us to tell Drupal how to create this class, whereas before um, Drupal would just make a new version of the class, but it wouldn't know what we needed to create that class with. Um, so that puts the responsibility back on us to tell Drupal how to create that, um, how to instantiate that class. Um, we can add properties um, and then inject values to the constructor, and then we can reference them using the, the, the magic this variable um, by using this service name and then method name. So in this example, um, we'd have in the services file, <coughs> we'd have um, services, uh, we give it a name, so this is uh, DC London dot speaker creator. We tell it which class we're going to use, and we also can pass a list of arguments, but in this case it doesn't have any, so we're just going to pass it in empty, empty array. Can you still see? Um, so in the controller, we're um, importing the controller base class. So this is, we're importing it here and then extending it. And yeah, so we're including the constructor. We're going to make um, a private greeter um, property. We're then going to pass that through into the constructor. And then we're going to set that property um, to this. So this is um, dependency injection, essentially. We're injecting the dependency into the class rather than calling it from within the class. Um, the other thing I've done is change it to use a greeter interface. Um, so there's a thing that says you should, um, it's one of the solid principles that you should build interfaces rather than um, implementations so that things are swappable if you need them to be. So if I wanted to change to a different greeter type, I could swap that out there. As long as we extend the same class or implement the same interface, then we can swap them out quite easily. Um, so the main thing we wanted to do was use this create function uh, method even. So it's a static method uh, called create. The main thing that this gives us is this container interface, or this container variable, which is an instance of a container interface. Um, and what we can then use is this container get method. And we can reference it by name. So we call it DC London dot speaker greeter. Uh, that could be that variable. Uh, and then out of this create method, we're just going to call, uh, we can return a new static. So static is just this class. So if we're inside um, speaker speaker controller, then it will just return back a speaker controller class. Um, but we're also passing this speaker greeter in there, and that's where that comes from, from that create method. <clears throat> As a result, um, within our hello method, we can then just use this greeter. So this is our service class here, and then use the greet method um, with the name. And it works in exactly the same way. So again, the added benefit is that if you wanted to change the type of greeter we're going to use, we wouldn't have to, ch don't have to change this class at all. 
we can we have to change things outside the class and we can just inject in a different dependency if we need to. That's what I already said. Okay, so then if we were going to take this a step further and if we say we were going to start logging results, um, we can do it in the same way. So we can add an extra, um, extra property called logger. And within the constructor, we got another argument. So the one that's used is the logger channel factory interface. We can assign it to this variable, and then we do it the same way. We assign that variable to that property. And within, there should be a create function in there somewhere. There it is. Yeah, so within that container, we can get that also from the container, call it logger. The name is logger.factory. Uh, we can then just add it into our new instantiation, so we can call it logger here. That then gets assigned to this variable, and then we can reference it in the same way. And um, so we can then just say this logger, that being the name of the class. Um, and then this is all stuff done by the logger class. We can get the default type and then pass it in. So that essentially logs our output. This bit is the same thing. Um, okay, so. The other thing that we can do within the container is called service parameters. Um, so yeah, within the same services.yaml file, uh, we can do the same way. Exactly, we can assign things as an argument into the constructor and assign it to a property. So in this case, we're going to set a variable. So as well as having services within our, within our services file, we can also have parameters. So these are essentially are variables that we're setting and passing it through into the constructor. Um, so we're calling this uh, speaker greeter dot shout. We're going to set it to be false. Um, and then within our arguments section, so this previously was empty, um, but now we're going to change it to use a, a list. So this is the way of doing lists in YAML, just to use an indent and then um, a dash followed by something. Um, and we tell it that it's a parameter by using this, this percentage and this percentage. Um, if you didn't do those, it would just pass in the string, which is no good to anybody. So we just, yeah, you wrap it in the percentage signs and it passes the value of the parameter in. Um, if we needed to inject a different um, service, we could use the um, at symbol followed by the service name and that would actually pass the whole service in rather than um, just the string. So this works in pretty much the same way. We assign it to a property um, we can pass in the word shout in here um, and then we can use if this shout and then do things. So I think in this case we're actually making it uppercase if it's if shouting is equal to true. So that just gives us the flexibility to move um, conditions outside of our logic, uh, outside of our classes. Um, the one thing I haven't put in this slide actually is these parameters can be changed um, outside. So there's a, a, a default, I think, I believe it's called default.services.yaml within core um, you can include so if you within settings of PHP you can tell to include um, a local uh, services file where you can override all these variables so if you wanted to change um, something you could do that outside you wouldn't have to touch any core code to change that you just change the parameter you pass into the code um, okay so configuration um, so configuration lives in the config directory within um, your module. Um, again, it's defined in YAML, so there's, there's a pattern version. Um, so, so slash src slash install, um, where you can add the files, add variables you want to install, to set when the module is installed. Um, you can then use an src schema file, um, sorry, directory, where you can define what your variables are. So they could be strings, they could be um, arrays, you can actually define what the variables are in that file. And there is an SLC optional, um, that should be, so that should be config, config, that's optional. Um, so this, I've seen it in like the Honeypot module where if somebody had the Tor module enabled, you can set variables that Tor module would use for Honeypot. Although I haven't had to use, actually use that in any sort of real sense yet, but it's, it's still there. Yeah, that should be config. Um, so in this example, um, so within config install, I've made a new file called dclondon.settings.yaml. 
Um, I'm going to set read a text as a uh, as a parameter, have a name, and then within the controller we can do the same thing. Uh, sorry, within the controller we can use um, slash Drupal, um, as, so we can get the Drupal class from the global namespace. Um, there's a static thing called config. We can get the name, so dclondon.settings, dclondon.settings, and then from there we can get um, the name of this variable. So we could this would return back hello at name, and then when we, when we pass it through into the um, class, it works exactly the same way. <clears throat> so um, I've also made a, a form for this module actually. Um, so the way we generate forms is to add a new root um, in the routing file, um, add a new control, add a new controller. Um, in this case, we're going to extend another class called config form base. And there's two uh, required methods that we have to call. So get form ID and get editable config names are two things we have to have to have to use. So those are those are required by uh, one by an interface and one by an abstract class that are dependent on later down the chain. So those we have to have. Um, and in my case, then I use two other methods that I overrode called build form and submit form um, for actually adding my own sort of fields and, and things and my own submit submit handlers. Um, okay, that's gone a bit quicker than I thought. Um, so useful tools. Um, PHP Storm I use a lot. I've been using for about a year and a half now. Um, but generally use an IDE rather than just a sort of text editor. Um, one reason that I like PHP Storm is auto-completion of everything, which is cool. Um, Auto-import classes. Um, so when I'm Rather than typing out all those really long sort of namespaces, it you can just start typing response and press tab, and it will import everything for you. Um, and there is a Symfony plugin that I think has like three million downloads or something, um, but it works very well with Drupal 8 because it's based on Symfony, um, which allows you to it auto completes all your root names from your YAML files. It does loads of stuff. Um, there is a Drupal Bridge plugin which I have used yet, but looks interesting. Um, Drupal console, if everybody hasn't used it, it's a, it's a command line tool that generates and scaffolds code. So if you can tell it to just do to create module or generate controller or generate thing, that it will just write code for you based off questions. Although it does actually interact with your site, so you can actually call uh, things like router rebuild or cache rebuild, um, and that you can get from Drupal console. Am I still in your way? Sorry, <laughs> from Drupal console. Um, Dot com just use download as a file file and you can um, download it. Uh, let's see, I'm at the end of my slides. I have got the actual module. If people want to, if I want to take a look at it, and I will put them up on GitHub as well by the end. So let's do a quick walk through of this to see if I can get it onto the screen. Come okay, on, there we go. And then you've got some question time still. There we go. So if I come up to all this stuff. So yeah, so my modules directory, we've got a custom directory, which is where my DC London module sits. Um, this, this is my info file, as, as we as we saw. Um, my routing file has all my routes in it. I'm going to collapse this down so you can actually see it. So this is where I've put my hello, my hello, um, my hello route, and that stuff. And then this is the config form that I made. Um, the SLC direct. This is a cool thing I have found with PHP Storms. You can assign files to different things. So I've marked this to be a sources directory. So if I take that away, it goes back to that sort of orange color. But then I can um, tell it to mark it as a sources directory. Um, so that knows how it contains classes to use as source, and I believe that if I go into directories, um, da, 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 modules, custom, DC, this is a very, very small screen. Yeah, I'm going to build it out. So because it's blue, you can see a source trait, but if there's an option hidden off the end of this screen, and you can tell it will auto-complete your namespaces as well for you. 
Um, so where am I? So these where I put my controllers. So I tend so these don't have to be in subdirectories, but I like to make them that way just because it's easy to see what's going on. So um, speak controller is the one that I was doing before. Um, so it's within the DC Linux controller namespace. These are all the import files that it needs. So it's using controller base. It's using the logger factory. Um, it's got the greeter interface that I did. Um, all those things have been set over here. Um, it's good practice to put these dot blocks at the top and to say which sort of type of things they are. Um, I couldn't fit them on my slides, unfortunately. Um, there you can see with these things. So again, it's good to, to type in things. So we're telling it that this greeter variable is an instance of greeter interface or something that extends greeter interface. Um, I can't get over to the right. Where are we? And the same thing then. For the, uh, it's gone. Ah, that would be better. There we go. So then I've got the logger channel factory interface that is the logger variable. Again, those both get set up here. Um, always set the parameters and then the return so it knows, so anyone reading your code knows what these things are. Um, we're passing the name variable through as, as we saw. Um, this is me getting the config. I'll put this away again. So we can use the Drupal code method. So this, this slash here tells it that this is within the global namespace. So it goes back up to the top of the namespaces and down. If I took that away, it wouldn't find it. It looks the class looks something within Drupal within our namespace which doesn't exist. Um, so I think this is where I'm setting um, the parameters to go into the container. And speaker and speaker greeters. This is the that's, this is the service class that actually does the things. That should be gone. Um, <clears throat> so yeah, there's the shout variables being passed through. It's set into this property, and uh, here we can say, yeah, if um, this shout or else. So we can use string to upper or you see first, depending on what set. Return that value back. Um, as I said, this implements the greeter interface. So <coughs> this is just a contract that says anything that extends this greeter interface has to have um, a public method called greet, which is where a lot of the flexibility comes from. So if I was going to change it to use a different thing. Um, as long as it implements this interface and it has that thing that it doesn't the speaker the speaker greeter doesn't know or care it's not its responsibility to know what's coming in it just knows how to deal with it um, so that's always good practice um, settings controller <coughs> excuse me um, this is my settings controller class extends config form base um, get editable config names. This I'm getting straight from the um, the, the routing from, from the services file, and then the get form ID method just returns back a string of which form ID it is. <coughs> so these are the two that are mandatory. Um, the build form method. So this is very this has hardly changed actually. The form API is very similar between seven and eight, and um, we still build up forms in the same way. <coughs> Excuse me. And um, the default value we're then getting from the config. Um, in this case, we're turning the parents. We're, we're, because we're extending this class, this class also has a build form. So we're returning, we're running the parent version of build form as well. We're returning it. And then the submit form, uh, we're using saying this config. So config is available by extending um, the other class. Let you set, just say set this variable. So variable, this is variable set and variable get essentially. And we save it, and then this and it does a um, Drupal set message, I believe. Yeah. So originally I had that as return. And it complains. <coughs> Excuse me. Okay, we can get rid of that again. That's not right. Um, so that's actually that. I'm going to put this code up on GitHub actually afterwards. People want to check it out and um, critique it and pull request it if they really want to. Um, that's fine. Um, yeah, okay. So, yes. Time for any questions. Have we got any questions? Yeah. Sorry. So, taking a look, 
that you might recommend for transitioning from Drupal 7 to 8? I, uh, I've been mainly looking at the Symphony books actually, so there's a, a big, um, if you go on symphony.com, it's got all the components um, are all listed out yeah, on there, so I tend so to go like through that. that. The so that's the way I've approached it. There is a Drupal 8 module to and book that's being written, it's not finished yet, but there is one on the way, so that would be pretty good, but that's at least what I've used. Um, up until now to get my head around a lot of the concepts in 8 so far. That's definitely been helpful um, be able to apply it in. And just looking through these examples, module is still there, um, looking through a lot of core modules, everything's really well documented in in this. But also I found a lot of the reusability, everything is a lot more reusable. It's like the number of times I've just said we use YAML for this and we injected through it, we use dependency injection everywhere, that that's consistent across everything. So once you've learned it in one place, it's very easy to apply where else as well. Um, the plugin system, which I haven't covered, is, is very similar. You know, you just use, it works the same, whether it's a block, whether it's a migration plugin, or it's all very similar. So the reusability is definitely a plus. Yeah. Um, in the first example, I was wondering why the hash markup doesn't look like that might be vulnerable to XSS attack. Possibly. Hash <laughs> markup. <clears throat> That's here. Yeah, so this is going through. The, so the question was, is um, is this vulnerable to cross-site scripting because it's going through markup? Um, in this case, we're using um, the T function, which is the same as what is in Drupal 7. Um, and depending on which thing we use here, um, depends on the level of sanitization. So you can either use um, an exclamation mark, which will pass it through um, as it was the same. Um, you can, I think, the at symbol sanitizes it without a placeholder and the percentage sign is sanitized with a placeholder. So that should get sanitized um, whichever way. I don't know if it, I think my first response is usually to actually call a response as you would do in Symphony, but then you'd end up with um, just a white screen with just the words hello something and you wouldn't get any theming there or anything like that in it. Um, but then I've always found then you have to use sort of render arrays as we did in Drupal 7 um, to do it. I'm not sure if you just return a string whether it would work. Try it afterwards. <laughs> okay. Can you show your services that you have Sure. This is, this is, yeah, so we've got the services section. This is the name of my service what I've called it. This is the class, so it's within the DC London namespace, um, it's within the service subdirectory, and it's called speaker greeter. Um, tags are also a thing, um, I haven't used them yet for this. Um, and then arguments, so it's taking this variable here and injecting it into that. There. And one thing that the synth, I believe I can then just control, um, command auto click and it'll take me here. So, um, the routing, uh, that was a silly thing to search for, wasn't it really? Um, yeah, this one. So we're actually, so here we're defining two routes. We've got the speakers, the speakers route, which is speaker slash name um, with the name. And then this is the one that's the configuration. Um, most of the core examples tend to use slash something. Um, here I haven't, both seem to work, but this seems to be the convention in core at least. Um, Any more questions? I know you're using mixed case folder names and file names. Mm -hmm. Is that sort of a new conventional? Because generally it used to be your lowercase and underscore the files and that kind of stuff. Yeah, this, so like with files like this, with, yeah, with yeah. the casing. Yeah, this, this is normally the way it's done, at least with Symphony, usually, is, is they're all done in this way, so they all start. It's not camel case, I can't think what the, what the name of it is. Pass it, I can't, yeah. But they, they do tend to start with, with um, uppercase letters and then um, by word. Um, and then the file names have to reflect that for auto loading. Um, the difference being that, um, yeah, something like this. But then tell me in a Drupal module, normally if that was, if this was like a symphony thing, it would be sort of 
Drupal, um, Drupal Camp London, if that was the name of the thing. But we're actually using the machine names, so it would be like the lowercase name with, with machines, in the same way that we have to use um, Drupal sl um, slash override node options um, slash controller. So again, if that was more of a symphony thing, it would be sort of override node op like that way. But that's, um, yeah, that's just a bit of Drupal, Drupalism. There are still some Drupalisms. <laughs> Less so, but still. Global tier list. So the question was where, but when I'm using T within the controller, I think it depends on where it's. It's silly thing to search for. <laughs> Speaker controller. Yeah, I think it depends where, where it's used because I've seen it used. 42, yeah, T. Yeah, I've definitely seen it used sort of this T as well. Um, Yeah, both both work in that case. Um, T. Yeah, so that's a particular function here from that trait. Yeah, I've, I've seen both. I'm not sure whether there's um, sort of a standard for I did try it doing one way once and it broke. So whether um, it was obviously in the wrong context, but in this case it seems to work for, for both. But um, yeah, it, it could also be a case that the T function is still there as it was, but sort of deprecated. So this is sort of my, my personal thoughts with sort of Drupal 9 eventually. Like, are we going to take away things like T that are just there for backwards compatibility and then we'll break that layer, sort of how um, Symphony 3 has done it. So Symphony 3 is 2.8 without the backwards compatibility. They've just taken that layer away. So I do wonder whether in this case sort of T is the backwards compatible version, whereas like, so you can still call things like node load, entity load, but they're sort of deprecated and you should use um, NC manager slash something, but I think maybe sort of now to work for that. Yeah. Um, so this is a function called T. What's the it's within right at the top. Uh, that's oh, that's that's in the global thing. But if I but if I call this T. Let's see. So if I go API slash T, let's see where it says. So the T function obviously still exists. Um, okay, when possible, use standard string slash T, otherwise create anything. Okay, so apparently, yeah, we should probably just use this T. again so t as it was is just within bootstrap.inc so as long as that file gets included the t function still exists as it was yeah, so it's not within a name is this within there <laughs> it works. Pull request it. <laughs> what, what is markup there? Cross down. This is difficult. Oh, right. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Wait. Sorry. Where are you looking? Markup. Yeah. Um. I'm not sure. It's marked as internal. Yeah. I guess it's probably that. No, I think, as uh, I say, a lot of stuff still works, like node loads still works, that type of thing. So a lot of the things still work, but I guess try and use the, the new way of doing it as much as possible, I guess, really. Got any other questions? Because I think it's quarter two. No, okay, no, one more. The Drupal console, is that similar to So it initially started as a scaffolding tool, so it was just very much like the Symphony console where you could um, just sort of generate a router uh, or generate a controller, it would just generate the class. But now it's sort of morphed into more of a, uh, it does actually, there's a cache rebuild, router rebuild as well. So it's sort of consistent there. Um, it's very, very similar. So um, yeah, Drupal console.
Thank you very much.